that has set the stage for our next speaker, uh, Dr. Dagmar Mayer, policy advisor primarily in charge of open access at the European Council, Research Council Executive Agency. The European Research Council particularly encourages innovative research. And in 2007, the Euro European Research Council Scientific Council wrote in its guidelines for open access, in the age of the internet, free and efficient access to information, including scientific publications and original data, will be the key for sustained progress. And then, the IRC requires that all peer-reviewed publication from IRC-funded research projects be deposited on publication into an appropriate research repository where available. The ERC considers as such an essential that primary data are deposited to the relevant databases as soon as possible. Since then, the Council has taken at different occasions a clear position in favor of the large promulgation of research results. But what is the purpose of this and how can it be brought about, what about the kind of support for the researcher, and what is the evolution in the frame of Horizon 2020? Thank you very much to be among us. Just getting rid of some cables here. Yes, um, good morning, everybody, and a uh, big thank you to the organizers of this event. It's always very um, interesting to really speak to the, um, to, to the people who actually deal with, um, in this case, open access and who are really concerned by it. And um, in that context, actually, I would be interested to know if there are any ERC grantees in the audience. Anybody? One? Only one? No. Two. Two? Oh, okay, great. So I hope that uh, what I have to say might be um, of interest in particular to you because I'm also going to say a little bit about our rules and um, how you can comply with them in case you don't know already. <laughs> okay, um, I have the habit to always go a little bit over time, so I'm going to try to be quick. Uh, I hope I manage. And um, first of all, I need to find my own presentation. That would be helpful. Let's see. It's supposed to be here, yeah. Okay, so um, as uh, I was already introduced, I work at the uh, ERC uh, executive uh, agency, and in particular, I work in the unit called Support to the Scientific Council. So we, we work directly with the, um, uh, with the scientists, the 22 scientists that constitute our governing board, if you want, and who are also responsible for setting some of the rules. Most of the rules are set by the commission, but in some respect, we also have uh, freedom to set our own rules. And in this presentation, then, I I also want to um, acknowledge some contributions by my colleague uh, Daniel Spichtinger from the uh, unit in charge of open access at the European uh, uh, Commission um, because we work very closely with them and uh, essentially we follow the same uh, policy, the same approach, but in detail we might differ a little bit and that's also going to be part of my presentation to explain where and why we might differ in some instances. So you have here the overview of all the topics I at one point was hoping to address. I don't think I will be able to do that. I will have to skip through some of the slides, but you will have the uh, chance to uh, download the presentation afterwards to look up some of the details that I might not be able to actually get down to. Um, so maybe to begin with, let me have a quick look at my watch, yes. Um, maybe to begin with, uh, for those of you who are not so familiar with the topic, just a very quick introduction to what open access is or what we understand by it, because different people have different opinions as to what it uh, really includes. For us, and that is also the same for the European Commission, open access is primarily simply online access at no charge to the user to scientific, uh, scientific information. And that means that we do not explicitly require any specific licenses, CC BY or CC whatever or any other licenses. We leave it up to the researchers to decide whatever is the best for them to use, but of course the opener the better um, is, our, is our philosophy, but we don't enforce that in any formal way. Um, what is important to keep in mind is, of course, that um, 
uh, specifically for publications, so open access concerns, of course, publications, but also data, but I'm not going to say very much on the data. For publications, it's um, clear that open access is always is something that comes after the decision to publish. So sometimes people ask, uh, open access, does it mean now that I have to publish everything? And of course, the answer is no. You publish in whichever way you want, open access or traditional in a subscription journal. And if it's in a subscription journal, then you have to think about how to make that publication open access. But the decision to publish has already been taken. So it has no influence on that decision as such. And in that same context, of course, it's also clear that open access does not interfere with the decision to commercially exploit uh, any of your results, because again, the open access decision comes afterwards. And also, as a reminder, maybe just because now there's been a lot of talk recently about this experiment that um, somebody was carrying out, sending a bogus article to all kinds of maybe not always very high quality open access journals. Um, and um, well, the conclusion by the media has been since this article that was all rubbish and didn't make any sense was actually published by quite a few of these journals, open access must be bad. And it's obviously open access journals don't practice any peer review. And that, of course, is, uh, is the wrong conclusion because, well, for many reasons, uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but um, what that experiment showed was that, uh, especially many of these predatory journals, obviously the review process is, is problematic. They either don't have any at all or it's not very high quality. But that is not primarily intrinsically related to open access. And I think um, we're going to hear a little bit more about uh, new ways of, of uh, um, peer review, um, implementing peer review in a more open way in the next presentation. And as a reminder uh, on the terminology, and I think I'm sure that most of you in this room will be very familiar with it, and um, what is gold open access? Um, again, there are different nomenclatures, but just to keep it simple, we call gold open access when open access is provided directly through the publisher, through the journal. Um, in many cases, that means that you have to pay an article processing charges, not always, but often. And these um, costs are then covered by the author or by the institution or by the funder. And the other model is green open access, which consists in depositing manuscripts in a repository, um, and then possibly after a certain embargo period, making those um, uh, publications openly accessible. And that is, of course, uh, in the first instance um, for the author free of charge. And this is, of course, also what, um, our, um, uh, what the dean was referring to about the transition from the subscription-based model, where the author doesn't have to pay anything, um, and uh, well, that's really the basis also of the, of the green model uh, to possibly uh, the, the model where everything is open access straight away, which might involve costs for the author. Um, and in uh, the case of hybrid journals, of course, it means also that the publishers might actually charge the same amount twice. But I'm sure we're going to have a little discussion about that later on. Okay, um, why open access? I think I can almost skip through this slide. Um, the EU policy objective is, of course, to uh, optimize impact of publicly funded scientific research, and the colleagues from the Commission are pursuing that in different ways at the European level through the framework program, for example, and then also in coordination with the member states by coordinating national policies and encouraging national initiatives. And uh, there's a whole list of expected impacts, and one of them is to produce better science because you can build on previous results. And I have highlighted this one here because this is really what for the ERC is the most important or the one that we mostly are interested in. So as was already pointed out um, for the ERC, the mission of the ERC is to support excellent fundamental research in all domains. And the expectation is that the outcome of this excellent research will be made accessible, available to well, essentially anybody who is interested, but in particular also to other researchers who might then uh, use it to further their own um, uh, research. Um, uh, and um, the ERC considers that the best way of doing this is, of course, by providing free online access um, to these materials. Um, we consider that that's the most effective way of uh, achieving the goal. So sometimes people say, yeah, well, you are a part of the commission, aren't you? I mean, what is the big deal? What's the big difference? Well, we're not really a part of the commission. The European Research Council was set up, was established by the European Commission, and of course, um, in many ways, uh, 
in the vast majority of, 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 of areas, we very closely follow or we completely follow the line uh, foreseen by the Commission. But we have different tasks in the process, so to speak. So I just have this slide here just to point this out. Because the European Commission has really many different um, um, roles to play. On the one hand, it's a policy maker um, through legislation, through uh, uh, co coordination with member states. Um, it's also a funding agency, of course, through the framework program and through many other funding programs. Um, the next one, the next research framework program, of course, being Horizon 2020. And it's also a capacity builder. And there are many different other roles that the Commission fulfills. On the other hand, the European Research Council is primarily really a research funder. And this is um, maybe also something that differentiates us a little bit from national funders. The, the ERC does not have a policy remit. In terms of policy, in particular open access policy, but also policy on, 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 on other, in other areas, gender, for example, um, or internationalization, it's really uh, the Scientific Council establishes a strategy, a scientific strategy. That's the way it's written down in the papers, but of course, that's also a little bit open to interpretation. But um, it's not the policy itself that's, done, that's um, uh, developed by, by the ERC or by the Scientific Council. The policy uh, remit really lies with the Commission. And um, so essentially what the ERC does with regard to open access is, of course, uh, we consider open access to be very important for what we want to achieve in terms of furthering excellent research. And in that context, we, of course, promote and support open access, but not as a policy goal in itself. So in FP7, in the current research framework program, there's the open access pilot um, that was launched by the Commission uh, right from the start in 2007, covering a certain part of the framework program, about 20% of the total overall budget. Um, a fundamental rule in the framework program, and because the ERC program, the ideas program is part of it, that of course also applies then to ERC projects, is that costs that are associated to open access are eligible under the grant agreement. So APCs, article processing charges, uh, but also costs related to providing open access to research data are eligible costs as long as the project runs. And uh, so that applies to all FP7 projects, whether they take part in the, in the pilot or not. And the ERC then joined the pilot in 2012 um, by introducing a special clause, special clause 39 ERC, in the model grant agreement, and this has been introduced ever since 2012 in all the ERC grant agreements. Uh, the one difference here, I was saying in the beginning, that sometimes on, de well, it's more than a detail, but anyway, on specific issues, we, are, we do not follow exactly what the Commission is proposing, um, because the ERC has said from the beginning that the maximum uh, acceptable embargo period should be six months, and not six months for uh, sciences and, and uh, 12 months for social sciences and humanities, as it is the case for the Commission. And finally, here I also would like to uh, mention the, the project Open Air and Open Air Plus, um, which is funded by the European Commission. Uh, it's an EU-funded portal. Well, it's more than a portal. It has a lot of associated services. But it really has been designed to help the Commission and also the ERC to implement its open access um, policy, strategy, whatever you want to call it. And uh, yeah, OK. <laughs> So I'm, I'm going to skip this one. Um, it's really just going a little bit more into detail of what I already said. And um, now let's go, on, go down to business uh, as to how exactly does the ERC uh, promote and, and, and what's the ERC's approach to open access. So as was already said, there was already a very early on a statement on open access in 2006 by the Scientific Council, which was then developed into more concrete guidelines from 2007. These guidelines were updated in 2012, made a little bit more snappy, shorter. The whole document is now only about an hour, uh, one page and a half. And two days ago, we actually, or the Scientific Council, adopted uh, a slight revision of the guidelines. So if you Google right now and you find the ERC guidelines on open access, you will still find the document from 2012. It doesn't have the latest revisions because we haven't put it online yet. So please do come back in a couple of days. Now, 
what do the guidelines say? And here I'm really um, going into the revision from a couple of days ago, but uh, the, the changes are small. Uh, so first of all, what may be different for other funders and what is also slightly different for the Commission, uh, we do, or the ERC does require open access for research papers and also for monographs. Now, I should say at this point already, and I'm going to go uh, make this even more clearer in, a, in a, uh, two slides down, um, these are really guidelines. So this document from the Scientific Council, not the original document and not the revised document, is not binding in any way. These are guidelines. This is what the Scientific Council has said. This is what should happen, what BRC grantees should do. But it's not binding. It's not uh, um, mandatory in a strict kind of legal or formal sense. Um, the maximum embargo period is six months, and now in the new guidelines that we just adopted, the Scientific Council has said, well, for the social sciences and humanities, really their research output has a longer half, to half time, if you want. So uh, we do accept now also 12 months for the social sciences and humanities. Um, again, something that differentiates us a little bit from the Commission is that um, really we uh, prefer, we encourage grantees to use discipline-specific repositories the, um, rather than institutional repositories. And I suppose we will also have a discussion on that when we talk about Infoscience. Um, and the idea behind that is simply, especially, I mean, if these are big, well-known repositories, that it will give greater exposure and um, make it easier to find the um, uh, research output that is being deposited in these um, discipline-specific repositories. Alternatively, um, if somebody prefers an institutional repository, that's perfectly fine, or also a centralized one such as Zenodo, and I'm um, happy to see that we also have a con contribution from Zenodo later on. Uh, there used to be a statement that was quite explicit on research data that um, uh, has been read out uh, in the introduction. That uh, statement on research data has been weakened in the new in the revision of the guidelines because the Scientific Council believes that uh, at this moment in time the infrastructure is not really fully developed yet and also the support services in the institutions, it, it's probably absolutely no problem in EPFL but especially in some of the smaller institutions the support services might not yet be fully developed to really support researchers and finding the right repository for their data and in sorting out all the legal issues related to uh, making research data available. And so there is now a slightly weaker statement that says, of course, research data should be retained and should be made um, available in order to verify research results um, uh, where this is requested. And host institutions are, of course, encouraged to cover the costs after the end of the grant agreement when this can no longer be, when, for example, APCs can no longer be covered from the grant. So that was the guidelines, non-binding, binding, and then we have the special clause, which is really a binding legal document. And the special clause has two parts. The first one talks about depositing uh, publications in the repository, which has to happen immediately upon publication. And the second part is about making best efforts to provide open access to these publications. Um, immediately, if it is an open access publication, and uh, otherwise within six months maximum. And now the special clause, because it's a part of the grant agreement for those grantees that have it, which is only the most recent ones, that the special clause is really binding. It's, it's really a formal requirement of the grant agreement. So the difference, I've summarized it here um, in one slide. The guidelines are aspirational, not legally binding, but they should, kind of philosophically speaking, they should be followed by all ERC-funded researchers on a voluntary basis, and the special clause is then legally binding, um, and it's only applicable to the grants from the last two work programs. And then, of course, people always ask best efforts. Well, I mean, if, how, how good do my efforts have to be to be considered to be a best efforts? And again, I'm not going to go into any of the details, but the important thing is that there is really a quite a clear definition, so to speak, of what is actually required. And that can be found in the Guide to Intellectual Property Rules for FP7 projects because the, this definition, this uh, flowchart of different steps to follow is the same for F any FP7 project participating in the open access pilot and for the ERC 
um, projects. Um, the first thing anybody uh, thinking about uh, depositing or self-archiving an, an article is, of course, to go to the Sherpa Romeo website, where you can put in the name of the journal or the publisher, and you can look up what are the um, copyright and, and, and self-archiving rules of the journal and of the publisher concerned, so you know whether the embargo period is six months or 12 months or even more, um, whether you can uh, deposit the final published version or the um, author accepted manuscript, uh, if there's anything else that you need to take into account, etc. Um, there are some rare cases, I think they're really becoming more and more rare, where a journal really does not offer any open access option or it doesn't offer gold open access and the embargo period is longer than six months. Well, where, to, to make it simple, where it's not possible to fulfill the requirements of the ERC or of the framework program. It's the same, the same idea. And in that case, um, the grantee or the institution is then encouraged, or not only encouraged, but required to try to negotiate better conditions, and if that's not possible, to at least think about going to another journal. But I've put here, I've underlined, there's no obligation. We do not force anybody to go to another journal, to publish in another journal than the one they have originally chosen, because they cannot fulfill the open access obligations. Um, but at least people should think about it, should consider it, because sometimes it is possible. And then, if all this doesn't work, then we need to have um, a, a proper record of the different steps that have been taken, and then that is acceptable. But to say simply, well, the embargo period is longer than six months, and I don't feel like spending the money on gold open access, that's definitely not acceptable. Okay, so I think I'm, my time is almost up. So I'm going to skip the next couple of slides. I have a few... Um, a few slides here on different support initiatives that we have engaged in to make it easier for uh, researchers to fil fulfill their ERC grantees in particular, to fulfill their open access obligations. Um, essentially, we are one of the members of the f funders group for the Europe PubMed Central um, uh, repository, uh, which our grantees in the life sciences are quite happy with, I think, because it allows them to set up their own PI account on the portal and link their publications to it and use it as an outlet for their, for their uh, as a green uh, open access repository. Um, you can see the last line here, the degree of take up is actually quite high. It's more than 50% of our grantees have chosen this, this path. We have also recently become involved in archive. Um, it's, uh, most of you will know it's a uh, long-standing e-print server. It's not yet a fully-fledged repository in the US, hosted by Cornell, which is important in particular for mathematicians and physicists. And uh, they finance themselves through some kind of crowdfunding mechanism, and the ERC has recently signed up to it. Possibly you've seen an article about it in Nature blog. We had a press release. And uh, there's some work to be done, but we are working on it. And on the social sciences and humanities, the situation is really so fragmented and so diverse that at the time, for the time being, we're watching the developments, but we haven't really foreseen anything very concrete for the moment, but this might change in the future. This is just a summary of what is going to change from FP7 to Horizon. The best effort uh, formulation from uh, FP7 will become a strict mandate in Horizon 2020 obligation to provide open access will no longer be enforced after the end of the grant agreement. This is due to some changes in the rules for participation. We are changing the rules on the uh, uh, acceptable embargo period, which will now also be 12 months for social sciences and humanities. And uh, everything else essentially more or less stays the same as far as publications are concerned. Um, there's the pilot on open access to research data, which is even though we're almost close to the launch of uh, Horizon, there are still many questions to be sorted out. There was a public consultation which attracted a lot of interest, and you can find the report and all the individual presentations on the um, website um, in, of, of the Commission. Um, it is a very complicated matter, and for that reason also the ERC has decided not to join the data pilot in 2014. We will revisit it uh, in the future. Uh, so, 
ERC will not take part in the data pilot, and as far as open access to publications is concerned, essentially here you have a summary of uh, what I already said. And I'm done, and I hope we still have a few minutes for questions and comments. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. I am sure that there will be some questions on ERC and guidelines and policy. So, Hello, thanks for the presentation. I have one question. Our Dean of Research just mentioned before that Bibliometrics was a very important tool for evaluating quality of research, and that was because of you were asking them to do that in order to assess the quality. Uh, I don't know. Can you hear me? Yeah. No. So, sorry. No. Um, I mean, um, bibliometrics was mentioned as an important tool for assessing the quality of science, and if I understand, it's your job to. Um, to fund good quality science, and you're, you're forcing universities to use that tool to, to hire people, uh, good researchers, and maybe to, to use that tool to, to achieve this goal. But my question is, is this goal not uh, a problem for disseminating open access? Because on one side, you want good science. You're, you're relying on um, well-known um, journals. And on the other side, you would like to have everything accessible uh, through open access. And there is some, I would say, I see some conflict in that because most of the good journals are not open access yet. So how, how do you think you can manage this problem? Um, where do I start? Okay, first, first of all, uh, yes, of course, we select what we think are the best projects or the, the most promising projects also. It's uh, not exactly the same thing. I mean, there really has to be a potential for a, a possible breakthrough. Uh, we're not that much interested in incremental research. Um, but you said we're forcing the institutions uh, you, you link that somehow to bibliometrics and that we are forcing institutions to use the same mechanisms and so on. No. Well, f first, first of all, actually, when we, uh, well, when I say we, I mean, when, the, uh, when our panels select the projects for funding for the ERC, it's not, they don't look into impact factors uh, or, or, or citation indices or anything like that. It's really the project itself, it has to have inherent merit and it has to have inherent quality. And it's not like um, you're looking at, yeah, that person has an H index of something and somebody else has a higher or lower, and then you rank people according to that. That's not how our selection works, and that's not how selection should work. I think that differentiates us also from some of the other funders. Um, then you said uh, whether choosing the best research, uh, there is a conflict with uh, open access because most of the really good journals are not open access. Um, there's actually three questions in one. So first of all, um, uh, depends on what you call a good journal. So uh, I mean, but if, uh, once again, if you link it to impact factors, then you're probably right that most of the journals with very high impact factors are not yet purely open access. Um, uh, as I said, I think most journals that certainly that our researchers, our PIs publish in, at least offer an open access option. Um, of course, yes, you have all that problem with double dipping and hybrid and so on and so on. I mean, we're not happy with that either, but at least um, on an individual basis, it does pro provide a solution because people can publish in the outlets that they want to publish in. Um, and then unfortunately, maybe it is a hybrid journal, okay, but we accept that, at least during a transition period. Um, now I forgot the rest of your question. <laughs> <coughs> because this has a cost, uh, my question was that you're pursuing two goals, to have good quality research and, and uh, yeah, open I, access, and but sometimes there is a conflict, maybe from the, the point of view of the researcher. 
Because well, the, the conflict maybe comes along if you talk about, uh, if, if you say, and, and we do hear that quite often when people say, um, we publish a lot, we're very active, um, and yeah, that's what you expect from ERC grantees also, and we publish in, mostly in journals where we have to pay an APC. And then, of course, that money that we spend on the APC is no longer available for research. Um, so in that sense, yes, if they don't know beforehand that they have to budget for this, then they may have a problem. But we, um, and I have to admit, maybe in the past we were not very clear on that, and make it really for the applicants to, to explain to them very clearly that they have to budget also suitable amounts for open access fees, but I think in the future, now that more and more people become aware of it, if you know you can get the money, you can earmark it, you can foresee it for this, then I don't think you have a problem anymore. As long, I mean, we are paying for it, so. Sorry for the long answer. No, interesting. Are there some other questions? No, everything's clear. One question about data preservation. It's uh, very expensive to preserve the data, research data. Uh, do you consider funding that in the future? Do we con consider funding it? Funding it, yeah. yeah. Um, well, again, it, uh, it depends a little bit. If, uh, if it's a very big project, uh, in, in climate research, whatever, like where there's really huge amounts of data um, uh, um, being produced. If it is inherent to the project, then I suppose it can be funded as part of, uh, uh, of the uh, project costs as such. For f uh, quote unquote ordinary cases where, I mean now of course we encourage uh, researchers in their publications, the underlying data to make the underlying data uh, accessible. That will also be um, expli made explicit in the data pilot in which we are not formally participating but we, we support the idea, then uh, for example now uh, if you deposit data on whatever, on Zenodo, or on Figshare as far as I know, uh, you don't have to pay anything. Uh, if you, there are some other repositories, Dryad for example, where you have to pay a modest amount, I think it's $80 or something per data package, that would be an eligible cost also under the grant. Thank you very much. So uh, 